It was a bloody incident, I promise. We don't want a repeat. Other than that, we're going to get this thing going. Uh, coming up, our next talk, we're talking all about the Viper framework and using that to track malicious actors. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colin Coey. Hi, thank you for having me. So just a quick introduction about myself. I go to Purdue University. I am about a semester and a few weeks away from uh, get graduating with the Bachelor's of Science in Cybersecurity. I'll be a part of the first class that has gone from freshman year to senior year with a Bachelor's of Science in Cybersecurity as our degree track title. And when I'm not doing cybersecurity stuff, I play lacrosse on the men's lacrosse team and I enjoy running and skiing. So just a quick overview about what I'll be talking about today is I'll be going over the Ryuk ransomware, a little bit about it when it first came into the scene and what it's done since then. And from there, I'm going to talk about my individual journey of tracking this ransomware over time, specifically with the Viper framework and how I've made some custom modules for that framework to assist in tracking this ransomware. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with how this methodology of tracking Ryuk could be applied towards tracking other groups of ransomware or actors. So Ryuk is named after a anime character from Death Note, and essentially in the show, he goes around and leaves a, a Death Note that gives the person who picks it up the ability to kill one person that he chooses, and he's seen as kind of a very chaotic character in the show. And I think the actors that first developed Ryuk really embodied that with the way they go about things. So Ryuk was actually modified from Hermes 2.1, which was originally used by the Lazarus group, which is attributed to North Korea. However, it is not North Koreans who create Ryuk. And so initially, when this was first identified by Checkpoint in August of 2018, a lot of people said, oh, Hermes was used by North Korea, so this must be North Koreans. And it wasn't until about a few months later when some other security companies like uh, CrowdStrike and FireEye came to the public and said, hey, you guys are completely wrong. This is not North Korea. This is our typical cybercrime groups. The way that they maintain uh, their foothold and are so successful with actually ransomwareing their environments is they wait until they have escalated their access to achieving domain administrator levels. They disable security controls, disable antivirus, and then they just encrypt everything they leverage good encryption, and oftentimes they get paid. So it was first posted on exploit.in in August uh, 2017. It is written in C, pretty small, lightweight. At first, it only cost $300. I'm assuming since then, it's probably gone up in cost. But there's two main methods of deployment. The first, which is a little bit less common, is through RDP brute forcing. But the most common methodology, which you may have heard about in a track earlier uh, yesterday, is through the TrickBot malware. So first, they use Emotet to fish and obtain access to that environment. From there, from there they deploy TrickBot, as well as utilize other typical uh, access privilege escalation tools like Cobalt Strike, Empire, some of that kind of stuff to pivot until they have control of the Active Directory environment. And then ultimately, they deploy Ryuk and encrypt everything. So the first thing they do when it actually runs on a system is it drops a script which runs NetStop on pretty much every service or security tool that it knows. It's been known to just try and stop literally everything. They will, cause if those services are uh, using files that are on that system, when it tries to encrypt it, it's not going to be able to get that file handle and it won't actually be able to encrypt it from the user. So what it first does is it uses netstop, scconfig, taskkill, as well as VSS admin to delete shadow copies. And finally, it does some manual searching for .back files and other common backup format files. From there, it looks for processes that are anything except for CS, RSS, Explorer, or LSAS, and attempts to hollow them and inject their malicious code into there. And finally, they encrypt everything except for EXEs, DLLs, and a file called .hermlog, which is actually legacy code from the Hermes ransomware. Uh, originally, they first started off by dropping a text file called ryukreadme.txt, which, uh, which had the typical content that you see from ransomware files. So it had a Bitcoin address, it had an email address, and it said, you know, 
the normal stuff of your files have been encrypted. There is no way to recover it except for contacting us. After about a couple months, they ended up switching this to a .html file as well as removing all that content and leaving it just the email address and the word Ryuk in the dead middle without any Bitcoin address. So within the first six months, they made $4 million. And that's just what was reported. Since then, due to the fact that they took out the Bitcoin address from those ransomware notes, it's made it a lot harder for researchers like myself to actually figure out how much money they've made. Additionally, many of their victims aren't coming to the public and saying, hey guys, like I got infected with ransomware and I paid $600,000 yesterday. If they're even going to say anything, they're most likely going to not tell them how much or not tell the public how much they paid. So if I were to guess, I would say it's at least over 10 million in profit since then, maybe even more. For an example, here are some entities that had to disclose to the public, most of them being schools and uh, public utilities or counties themselves. But the range of price that they normally charge is typically at least six figures. You know, there was a school in New York that paid 88K, but then on the high end of things, there is a town in Massachusetts where they demanded 5.3 million in ransom. The uh, sysadmins at the town contacted the actors and said, hey, you know, we don't really have 5.3 million to pay for this, but our insurance can cover up to 400K. Will that work? And they're like, yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> An example of this that actually happened one week ago today was a shipping company called Pitney Bowes. I don't know if I pronounced that. Sorry if anyone works there. But in 2016, they made... 3.4 billion in revenue. So they are a very successful company, have a very big international presence. And uh, about a week ago, they got infected with Ryuk ransomware. On the right, here's a screenshot from, it looks like maybe a customer or an employee who they commented on that tweet and said they were trying to ship out their IRS tax form and they needed proof that they'd shipped it or else they'd get a some sort of penalty. But unfortunately, None, nothing was working. Their computers had errors. It told them just to unplug the power and put it back in, but that did not work. After they got infected with that, their stock decreased by 4% within the first 24 hours, and within three days, they paid the ransom fee. A security researcher at the same time of this went on Twitter and said, oh, looking at our data, we can see that they were infected with Emotet before which is really continuing that pattern of Emotet to TrickBot to Ryuk. They will also drop other ransomware like BitPaymer and stuff like that, but it really just depends on the group. So a little bit about how I personally got involved with Ryuk. So at a previous role I was in, I was uh, providing consulting services, to some pen testing, some incident response, really just depends on what our customers wanted. And we had a global inventory warehouse management company that got hit with Ryuk ransomware. This was in October last fall, so about a year ago. They came to me and said, hey, we've been really badly in like infected. We don't have any backups. Right now our warehouses are shut down. Can you take a look at this for eight hours and let us know if we can decrypt, if it's even possible? So for eight hours, I, you know, I threw it in IDA, start reverse engineering it, trying to see if there was any flaws in their key management. Unfortunately, I had to go back to my boss and say, hey, you know, you guys are out of luck here. Everything's encrypted. Unless you have their keys, you can't do anything. But for me personally, I felt very defeated by the fact that I was unable to find any flaws, but it also made me curious as to how could a group be so successful that they could make this money. And for, for the record, that company ended up paying 500000 in Bitcoin. So that, that number alone made me interested in what they did that was so successful. So the Viper framework is, actually I'll get to that in a little bit, just my methodology of how I went about this research was first I developed signatures around Ryuk ransomware, specifically with Yara rules. From there I did threat hunting on VirusTotal as well as other platforms such as hybrid analysis, collected malware samples, and then finally I put it in the Viper framework and did some clustering and similarity analysis. Over here is a screenshot of just the uh, the YAR rule that I've been using to this day. Over time, I've modified this and tweaked this as I can. And as I've determined what strings are the most necessary and what maybe has some false positives. But stuff like Hermes and no system is safe and VSS admin, those commands that they use when they first drop, 
have remained the same throughout the, f the full year that they've been acting. And this Yara rule has helped me uh, make a lot of pattern matches on Ryuk ransomware. So the Viper framework, quick show of hands, who here has heard of the Viper framework before today? A good couple of you. So for those who haven't, it's a binary, um, binary management framework system. So basically all you can do is just plug in a bunch of files, it stores it in a small backend, and then you can run Python plugins on it. It really just helped me store everything in one place because when I first started this research, I was keeping everything in just one folder and a Google Sheets. And I quickly started to realize that that was not a good course of action. But uh, Viper has a series of plugins that you can run. Some of them are custom built, some of them are more popular, but they can do stuff like pull PE information, EXIF data. Um, you can analyze stuff with Radar A2 directly from Viper, or you can develop your own custom plugins to do whatever you want. So a custom plugin that I built basically will go through every single file that you have in there and just pull out the name, the MD5, the timestamp, do some regex for IPv4s and see if it sees that it has any emails in there as well. And so on this screenshot on the right, this is actually within my Ryuk data set. And one of the interesting things here is I added a custom search for FTP put file. And out of all the Ryuk samples that I found, there's about like three or four of them where someone modified it so that it would actually go through that file system that it infects and attempt to ship off any files that matched a keyword to some FTP server they threw up. Just a unique variant of Ryuk. So for what I did with simulator analysis, when I started this research, I was reading a book called Malware Data Science, which really got me more interested and involved. And they talked about n-grams, which essentially looks at patterns, but not just what's in the binary, but actually the sequence that it's in. So if I had a executable and it had string A, B, and C, it would take that sequence and it would put it as one n-gram. From there, it would go to the next B, C, D, and that would be one n-gram. Then within my actual research, I would look at the total number of features that it could extract, which is just the pattern of strings and the order that it's in, and compare that to the number of patterns that are in other samples. So instead of just looking at the content, we're looking at the order of content and comparing them with other samples. So one interesting thing that I quickly saw with the Ryuk uh, ransomware that helped me track it over time was the use of PDB files. So every time you compile a file, it will include a string that has a path to that debug symbol. So even if the malicious actor doesn't have that debug file in their ransomware or whatever malware it is, there's a good chance that they didn't scrub this path. And so this can give you some insight as to what the developer who was creating the ransomware or malware was actually developing it in. So the very first PDB file that was spotify or spotted within the uh, Ryuk ransomware is this one right here, projects from Ryuk. From there, it actually adapted and modified to console application, which then went to console application 54, console application 54, new crypt it, new crypt it with process kill, new crypt it with process kill within another process, and so forth. So although some actors didn't include PDB paths within their ransomware, some of the actors that were using Ryuk would leave it in, and that actually helped me track it over time because I could see as they were changing the code that those PDB paths were actually changing with little comments on top of it. I created a plugin for the Viper framework that would go through all my samples, run that similarity analysis using those n-grams, and then graph it. On the left is the first iteration that I did with this, which was just using GraphViz, which is a uh, open source Python library. But as my data set got bigger, it got more and more messy and harder to manage. So I ended up porting it over to Neo4j, which is a um, web application framework that's used in Bloodhound and a bunch of other projects as well, which is shown on the right. Some results from a data set that I've been collecting over the past year. If you look within this actual cluster, all these samples have the exact same timestamp, which was in July. 2019. This cluster over here was all had the same PDB path of uh, new crypt it with process kill. But not all of them, as I mentioned, have PDB. So you can see this cluster over here didn't have anything. 
This one, D, was right after the Chinese New Year. So I think the Chinese New Year was literally the day before all these were compiled. And then you can see this smaller cluster over here had PDB paths that were projects from Ryuk, which are from the original data set. So through n-grams and clustering with Neo4j, I could actually visualize these groups of malware and start to pick out, you know, what outliers are there and why are there outliers? Is it an issue with my, uh, is it an issue with my YAR rules? Is it an issue with their code? Is it a flaw in the way I did this? Or is it just a false positive of that nature? But it also helped me clearly visualize how they were changing over time and see that although there is some overlap in these samples, there is enough difference and variance that they actually are clustered entirely different. And it was really reinforcing to see that the PDB paths would actually match with that clustering. So some of those groups are have very high thresholds where a ton of samples were pushed out in a short period of time, one of which being that right after New Year's and the other one being in the middle of July of 2019. So Right now, this is where I've taken this research, but in the future, one of the things that I want to do is actually incorporate Cuckoo Sandbox to this and start to do some similarity analysis on dynamic, not just static, as well as compare how those ransom note has changed over time and continue to get more samples on Ryuk. Are there any questions? So the, the plugins that I have and that I've written are all um, on GitHub and open source, but I have done some, like, I have some uh, paper that is in, process, in the progress of being written, but I haven't published it, but I can do that. Uh, I haven't looked at any specific journals or anything. Most likely I'll probably put it on Twitter. They seem to accept it. <laughs> the protocol. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. One more question. Um, have you encountered any anti-analysis techniques in that they would be pretty much, you know, open with the start of the So they, some Ryuk samples will go through a lot more to encrypt their static content. And so some of these, some of these outliers here, it seemed like the actor that deployed it took another step to go through the content and just harden it a little bit. So maybe maybe it's a more elite actor or maybe it's someone thought, hey, maybe we shouldn't leave the debug path in our binary that we're sending to production. The PDB paths? So I think it's uh, still very new research. Uh, Steve Miller from FireEye just recently published a report about two months ago where he took a bunch of these debug symbols that he knew and that FireEye has seen and they mapped it to common samples and known families. So I think that the process of looking at those patterns and utilizing that to track them is still a up and coming uh, methodology. Any other questions? Thank you.